Okay, in this session we're going to be talking about Jomini, and this is our lecture getting us ready for the lab. What we need to stop and think about before we actually heat something and cool it is how we cool it. And if we were to heat up a piece of steel to what we call the above the recrystallization temperature, that's going to be typically above 1600 degrees Fahrenheit or 850 degrees Celsius. We're looking at the annealed steel here by letting it cool down slowly. That's going to let things happen that we want to have happen there. And if we take a piece of metal and we cut it, and you guys have already been in lab where we cut some metals and we polish and etch and we reveal the grains, and we should see in a steel something like this. Now this is a low carbon steel that's been annealed, heated up, and slowly cooled. We're going to see some dark grains, which is what we call perlite. So you need to start remembering these names. This is perlite. This white stuff here is going to be ferrite. And we're going to be able to calculate these because these are different phases of these materials. Now this is an iron carbon alloy, low carbon material. We're also going to reflect a little bit about what's happening in the crystalline structure that you're going to learn in theory or may have already learned in theory. Now. This crystalline formation is basically when we talk about a unit cell here, we're going to have something that comes out of solution. So A here is a liquid. And so we're talking about having steel that's a liquid. And it could be even that it's um, starting to cool down. And at some point, we're going to have what we call a nucleization point. So in copper, we might throw ber uh, beryllium in there and make more nucleization points. And that's going to make more grains, have a finer grain. Remember, we talked about grain size earlier in one lab. So what we're going to have is these things are going to tend to grow and repeat. And it's a crystalline repetitive structure, kind of like Legos being built it on and added on. So we have in stage B here, we're seeing the crystals start forming here. And C, we're really seeing the crystals take shape. And then they start colliding with each other. And where they collide, that's going to form our grain boundaries. So if I was to take pure iron with no carbon and cut it, make a sample, polish it, etch it, I could look at the structures and see nice white areas here and that's going to be a grain of ferrite which is basically my iron and I can see the amorphous areas that intersection of these grain areas because the grain itself is crystalline and that's going to eat at the grain boundaries if I get it to the right etching I can see the grains and so that is how we see our crystal formation now when we talk about these grains we need to understand what's happening in steels in terms of lattice structures and I've kind of taken a lot of stuff out of the main lecture here just to do a quick one. There's some terms you need to have. Body centered cubic. BCC. What we're saying here is we're going to have a square structure equal in all dimensions. We're going to have an atom and that's going to be an iron atom at each corner as well as we're going to put a full iron atom in the center. So if we just took an imaginary knife and cut that thing up, we're going to see an eighth of an atom at each corner and a full atom in the center. So representatively, we have two effective atoms in one unit lattice structure. This shows the repeating structure making that crystal. Now this is what most of our steels are going to be. If I heat them up and slow cool them annealing, I'm going to have a body centered cubic structure. Now, if I take the steel and I heat it up to that recrystallization temperature, again, 1600 degrees, you know, 800 to 850 degrees Celsius, we're talking about letting that metal have a phase change. Okay, it's not melting, but the atoms are going to move and we're going to have face centered cubic. We're still going to have a nice square, evenly shaped square here with an iron atom at each corner, but now we're going to have half an atom sharing between one unit to the next. We're going to have a half effective atom here on the faces. So we have six of those and then an eighth of all these, and we can figure out how much atoms we have in that one unit lattice structure. So this is face-centered cubic. Face-centered cubic is not magnetic. So if I take a magnet and I put it on steel that's at room temperature that's been heated up and slow cooled, it will stick. If I take the steel and I heat it up to 1600 degrees Fahrenheit, above 800 degrees Celsius, put a magnet on there, it will not stick because it's face centered cubic. So stainless steel or 316 stainless steel is a face centered cubic material. Gold is face centered cubic. 
lead is face center cubic. Those materials are non-magnetic. So we've seen a phase change in those materials. So this is our phase changes of iron. If I'm doing blacksmithing in my shop and, and I'm open outside and I can't really see the color of the metal because the color means things, I have a magnet on the side and I can tell by this how tightly it wants to adhere to the metal, kind of the temperature. And after a while I learn, I can tell by magnetism what phase my material's in. So what we're talking about here is Basically, at room temperature, we're at body center cubic. We call that alpha iron. Once we go up past the Curie point, the non-magnetic point here, the material becomes face center cubic. Now, most of our stills we're going to heat, we're only going to go to here and then cool down. We're not going to go to liquid and all that and talk about that theory at this point in the lectures. So we're going to take that face, or I mean the body centered cubic here. Now, oh, you're showing some different atoms in here. Each white one is an iron atom. And at the centers here, non-lattice points, so we call these lattice points, and these are non-lattice points, this little dark one is our carbon. So higher carbon, we're going to put more of those in there, okay? That's an interstitial uh, strengthening mechanism that can make metal stronger. What we're going to do is come in here and heat this up to face center cubic okay so the carbon is still going to be out there we're going to see those atoms move to the faces from the center and this is now fcc and then we're going to rapidly quench it we're going to quench it in water and it's going to want to try and go back to body center cubic i mean if we anneal it it will go back to body center cubic but we're going to rapidly quench it in something and it's going to elongate this and it looks like this structure pretty much it looks like the Iron atoms are all in the same place, but it's longer in one direction. So it's going to make a needle-looking elongated structure. And we call that BCT, body-centered tetragonal. So it looks like body-centered cubic, but it's elongated in one dimension here. And this is what we're going to be striving for when we quench. We strive to have martensite. Martensite is going to be a form of structure in the metal that is going to be really, really strong. So let's talk about when I cool that material and I kneel it slowly, I'm going to end up with primarily ferrite and perlite in what we call a hypoeutectoid steel. Those aren't very strong. We're going to talk about the strengths of those in a little bit. What's strong is this martensite. This stuff is really strong. Hardness reflects strength. So if I look at ferrite and perlite here, based on carbon composition of the material, so I increase the carbon content of my steels. This is a 1020 steel, a 1040 steel, this is a 1080 steel, this is my eutectoid steels that we'll be talking about. They get somewhat harder, but I'm still only getting to like a 20 or, you know, on the Rockwell scale. Now, that's if I slow cool. If I can heat treat this stuff, heat it up and quench it, I can start producing this martensite. So lower carbon steels don't like to make martensite that much because there's not enough carbon in there. If I come in here and put more martensite or more carbon in there, it's going to make more martensite. And that's going to make a harder structure, making it stronger. Now, what is martensite? This is formed by a shear mechanism where we're trying to go from FCC to BCC but it becomes body center tetragonal, the BCT. And the metallurgists are going to refer this to as white feathery structures. Okay, this is like art appreciation hour, correct? And so this is what Martin Sight zoomed in heavily would look like on a microscope. Now then, we're going to be testing the hardenability in this lab of materials. It's basically the measure of the hardenability of an alloy forming that martensite. So we're going to see how well different alloys based on carbon and alloy compositions produce martensite. And we do this with a Jomini in quench test. And here's the ASTM standard right here. So you guys may want to look that up. We have a sample that is going to be four inches long, one inches in diameter. So you need to remember that four inch long sample, one inch in diameter. We're going to put it in a test stand that's going to minimize contact for heat flow from the sample to the test stand. We're going to spray water on that sample at the bottom. So you're going to have water on a half inch ID coming up. And what we're going to do is without the sample in there, the water is going to shoot up one inch past this nozzle. Okay. Now, 
this one inch diameter sample, if we have it in here, the nozzle needs to be at half inch from this surface right here. So we have a half inch gap. This is going to maintain constant flow rate and cooling action happening down here. So we're going to cool that metal from the bottom and let it cool over time through the rest of this. This is going to take probably over 30 minutes to cool this material. So we're going to drop it in there and let that water quench on here. You're going to see a nice umbrella of water being developed and we're going to quench that material. So as we look at this hardenability curves, uh, we're quenching the water on the end of that sample. What we're going to do is take hardness values at different intervals per the lab sheet on a surface. Now it says a ground flat. You guys are going to use a round bar. One of the bonuses in this lab is you guys are going to learn about protective atmospheres. If I take steel and I heat it up to temperatures like 1600 degrees Fahrenheit, it's going to react with the free oxygen in the air and we're going to get a lot of scale developed on that part and it's not very pretty. So what we're going to do is create a stainless steel pouch, put a little paper in there, it's going to burn off the oxygen and then we're going to have a nice clean sample. And for us, we want you guys to work with roundness correction factors. So we're not going to grind a surface on here. You guys are going to take measurements and apply your roundness correction factors on here. We cover that in the section on Rockwell testing. So make sure you apply roundness correction factors there. Um, what's going to happen is the distance from the quench end. So this is going to be the quench end right here. And this is the hardness. We're going to see these values being harder and getting softer over distance. Okay, that's time, reflecting time of cooling time because it's going to take a long time for it to cool upwards of this bar up here. And so we're going to see that time and distance and we're going to see the hardenability. So in different steels with different carbons and different alloys are going to have different plots in terms of hardenability. So here we have a plot and we've kind of turned the sample on side where we're taking the measurements of hardness at the end as we go through here. And we're going to start developing something that we're going to see down the road called a isothermal transformation diagram, an IT diagram, or sometimes we call it a time temperature transformation, a TTT diagram. So you want to know both of these uh, names for this diagram. And the way we establish these diagrams is we would take some alloys, a uh, bar material, we would do this geometry test, and we would look at each, inter each interval of measurements here and look at the predominant structures under a microscope. And they would create this graph that's going to represent that steel. So every steel is going to have a different graph. We're going to look in a little while and look at MatWeb and uh, the not so much matte web, but we're going to look at the uh, novels, heat treaters guides, and see where we can find these for each steel. So what we're going to do is this is a generic one. We're going to say that it's definitely going to get hard out here. Um, this is a faster cooling rate, okay, and it's going to have martensite. So if I was to shoot down here and follow this trajectory, and I come down here, and this is in Celsius here. Here's 200 degrees Celsius. I'm going to hit this thing called martensite start. I've got to cool it at a rate and I've got to get in front of this curve right here this black curve we'll be talking about that I want to cool it and go past the martensite finish and at this point I'm going to have martensite at the end because it's going to cool quick and we're going to get in front of this main curve right here if I cool it slow okay this this brown one here and I let it go through the trajectory down here it's going through here it's going to come through here and become from austenite to perlite and if I go on down through these lines, it's going to be pearlitic structure. Okay, it's going to look like a fingerprint when I look under the microscope versus the white feathery martensite. Again, as I start doing things like coming through the curve at different points along this, I'm going to get mixtures of martensite and pearlite, fine pearlite. I'm going to see a combination of different structures being developed here. Again, IT diagrams, TTT diagrams. So this is a diagram for kind of a generic diagram that I like using because it has a little bit more information on here and some things we can do with the steels. Once we heat it up above the austenitic temperature, okay, and, and that's going to change from steel to steel. So we usually run a little hot just so that we can run any and every alloy with the same furnaces. It's not going to hurt anything. We're just going to run a little hot and it gives us a little bit more time to get it to the quench tank. 
we're going to be above what we call the eutectoid temperature, the austenitic temperature. We're going to get it to A, which is austenite. Okay, it's not liquid at that point. It's just austenite face center cubic. We want to get in front of this curve right here. Okay, and to do that, we need to get in front of this quench. We're austenite here, austenite there. Go martensite start and finish, and then it's 100% martensite. If I come down through here, I've got some perlite coming out of solution with austenite, and I can end up with a variety of different structures here. We have four names here. A is for austenite. B is for bainite. We'll talk about that one here in a minute. I'll put that one in black to remind myself. M is martensite. You know what that is. That's what we're trying to make. That shear mechanism, the hardest material. We really like that, but it's hard. It's brittle. Okay. So we want to remember that the martensite is very hard and strong, but very brittle. Um, so we usually temper that afterwards, a secondary process. Perlite is not going to be as strong. We talked about ferrite as well. Now, this bayonite, um, I can make right here, and this talks about quenching products for steels. If I slow cool and anneal it and come through the curve, I'm probably going to end up with perlite and ferrite. It's depending on the composition. If this was a 1080 steel, it'd be 100% perlitic then. If I quench it and get in front of the, this knee of this curve right here, then it's going to become 100% martensite. Now, what is this bayonite thing? Bayonite is going to be a nice hard structure, not as hard as martensite, but it's going to be tougher. It's going to be a little bit more not brittle. Okay, so maybe I don't need to do tempering on that. That's a neat product. We're not going to do that in lab, but we might see some bayonite in some of our products as we look at some of the microstructures. So bayonite is going to be hard, not as hard as martensite, but it's going to be tougher. Now, how would I make bayonite? We call this a process called os tempering because normally when we do martensite, then we have to go and temper it. So os tempering is also where we're making bayonite. So if I have liquid salt, basically, right here at these temperatures, I can drop my piece of metal. Now this is for smaller pieces of metal. So like if I had some 1040 steel, 4140, things like that, that are fairly smaller cross sections, I'm not going to see a huge delta T in the quenching. So I'm going to put less stress and possibly not quench crack things. There's a lot of advantages to this, but it's going to come in here. And since it went into salt, it's going to hit this temperature. It didn't get to the martensite start. It's going to shoot through the bayonotic areas. We're going to end up with bayonite. Wow, we got bayonite. What does bayonite look like under a microscope? I didn't put a slide on here. It's dark and feathery compared to white and feathery on the images that we would capture microstructure. So this is going to be a nice process because it's going to be not as hard and I don't have to temper it. That's why it's called os tempering. Now then, let's look at the effect of carbon on the hard hardenability of steels here. We have an alloy steel, 86. The first two numbers always represents the alloy. Okay, so a low carbon steel that's not alloyed would be something like a 1020 steel. Okay, the next two digits, the 20 here, the 30, the 40, the 60, the second two digits represent percent carbon by weight. So we're here we have 0.2% carbon. Here's a 30, and here's a 40, and here's a 60. So the more carbon we have, the more hardenable, again, this is distance, this is a hardness, we're going to see as we increase carbon, the potential of making more martensite come into play. Now we do have some effects of alloys here, but we are comparing only the differences of carbon in this plot right here. So what does carbon do for us? Carbon is going to move the knee of the curve further to the right. You guys remember that, that knee of the curve we talked about? Every steel has a different plot. The higher carbon contents, that knee moves further to the right, giving us more time to get in front of there to make that martensite. That's pretty cool. Now then, let's talk about effects of alloying elements. Here we have all the same carbon contents. We're at a 0.4% by weight at Here's a 1020, here's a 4140. What are we doing here? We're changing our alloys. Remember the first two digits are alloys, second two digits are percent carbon. And so we're seeing the effects of some of the most common steels that we see out there. Here's that plain carbon steel down here, 1040. Not hardenable at all. Uh, yeah, that first little bit, we got some hard 
material didn't even really break 55 here. I mean, we're going to be lucky getting 50s out of this. And it's it's not going to get hard throughout at all. So it's not a through hardening material. Look at this 4340. Isn't that nice? She got hard and it's going to stay hard all the way through here. And that material is going to be wonderful because it has a wonderful through hardenability. And that's what I'm going to want is something that's through hardenable on, on maybe in certain applications. 4140 is another really good material. Look at that. Isn't that nice? So hardenability can be changed by carbon and it can also be changed by alloy. So I feel like we understand how we're creating our TTT diagrams, time temperature transformation, and some of the products we're going to get. And what we need to do is look at the heat treaters guide. Now, again, I have on your course website a link that will take you to Novel, which is an OSU library resource, and it will take us to the heat treaters guide for ferrous materials. We also have one for non-ferrous materials we'll use later in other modules. Now then, what's nice about this is you guys have full access to this whole book and you can actually download things. Now there's two searches within the screen. We have search all of novel. We don't want to do that. That's going to look for all the different journals and everything, which is a book similar to like this. We want to search within this reference. So let's go look at 4140. I love 4140. It's a great material we use out there and it's a common one you're going to put in your toolbox. Okay. Now, once you do that, you're going to come down here and you're going to look at 4140 and we're going to be able to see there's quite a few of these. And if you click on one of the 4140s right here, it's going to bring us to that section of 4140 right here. So I'll get that off that little ad right there. What we have here is 4140. It tells us in a heat treaters guide the chemical composition, what stills. So if we're dealing with other countries and outsourcing materials, we can deal with that. It tells us about the characteristics of this material tells us how to anneal it and how to heat treat this. Remember we talked about heating it up above 850 degrees Celsius, 1600 degrees Fahrenheit. Yeah, we're going to be able to definitely anneal this. And we're, we're doing it up around 950 Celsius, I believe, in the, in the lab. So we're doing that fun stuff. Tells us how to cool it and everything. Tells us how to quench the material and heat treat it. And then looky here what we have. Isothermal transformation diagram, an IT diagram. For this material and so here is its diagram we said each material has a different diagram we have a logarithmic scale down here representing time so here's our temperature we got to austenite we're going to get in front of that curve and it tells us what kind of products we're going to get for this kind of steel because every steel is a little bit different there this is our martin site start and finish lines down here now then one nice bonus feature that this has in the heat treaters guide almost all these steels are going to have a in quench hardenability. So here's a simulated test that somebody has done as part of this book, and they've actually made a graph of hardness versus quench in. So this is going to be a nice source for a comparison of what we expect with what we measured in lab. Now, later on in future labs, we're going to learn a lot of stuff in here, and you're going to need to data mine some of this stuff for various things. And I'm going to go all the way to the end down here. And looky here what we have. We have sample microstructures for that material. Let's look at A right here. Okay, if I go to A, A says that what? What do we do to A here? We basically normalize this, which is a better grade of annealing if you want to think about it. Um, so basically we anneal this sample for an hour and it tells us how we did that. And it tells us what we see. We see ferrite, coarse uh, perlite coming in there and we if we look down here what it's saying is we're seeing these nice phoretic structures the grains with the fingerprint looking perlites in here and they're at the right ratio so we can kind of sense what an annealed 4140 is going to look like again in the lab we're going to hand you guys some annealed samples and you're going to be able to compare and say hey what are those structures and identify them this is going to be very helpful for you to 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 look at these heat treaters guides. The other thing we have is what happens if we come in there and quench this? So let's look for one that's been heated up and quenched here. And okay, so here we have C right here. It's basically been austenized and then water quenched. Now we don't normally like to water quench 4140. We'll cover that later in heat treating. 
but we're going to look at this. It's going to have untempered martensite. Hey, that means it's going to be long and needle-like, white feathery, correct? And we're going to see this structure. So let's look for C here. Here's our white feathery structure that we would expect to see as a fully quenched structure. So using the heat treaters guide is going to be a great source for you to look at the different alloys you have as to what structures you're going to have there. You can get the uh, Jomini data, the anticipated structures you're going to have. Each still will have a page that is in the same format as this. I hope that helps you out. We'll see you in lab.